Saggers played a vital role in the coal-fired bottle ovens. These fire-resistant containers protected the pottery from the intense heat, flames, ash and corrosive gases during the firing process. In fact, the name Saga may come from the word safeguard. They were made from a coarse local clay known as Saga Marl. Sagas were produced at the rate of about ten an hour by a team of people working together. One or two skilled Saga makers, a frame filler and a Saga maker's bottom knocker. I started when I was 14, bottom knocking. And that was bottom knocking for two Saga makers and then he had a frame filler. It was a pound a week when I started. A uh, train fella was on two pound, and the top saga maker would be on about seven pound, eight pound. Of course, in them days, you, you had to wait for a saga maker to die before you could get on a wheelie. Because nearly every pot bank carried one or two, some carried uh, three, four. The frame filler formed the sides of the saggers by beating out a sheet of clay using a heavy wooden mallet, known as a mow. Weighing some 15 kilos, the mows were stored in water to stop them drying out and splitting, and to keep them heavy. The frame filler then wrapped a strip of flattened clay around a wooden drum to mould it into the right shape, using sawdust or sand to stop the clay from sticking. The bottom knocker, as the name suggests, formed the bottom of the saggers, making the precise shape by flattening a lump of clay to fit inside an iron hoop. And you used to have to keep at least five to six bottoms in front of the saga makers, because if they were waiting, you'd only got one, and the other saga maker hadn't got a bottom to put on his wheel, then you were for it, and you got a real good cossy. The real skill was in joining the sides to the bottom. This was the saga maker's job. Made in a variety of shapes and sizes, according to the type of wear they were to hold, the saggers were put aside to dry. Then they were fired empty, right at the top of the oven, because they wouldn't support any weight. Once fired, they were ready for use. The extreme heat inside the ovens meant that each saga only lasted for 30 firings or so. When cracked beyond repair, they were left in heaps, known as shawdrucks, around the factory. The decorated ware was now ready for glossed firing. First it was placed in sagas of different sizes and shapes. Some goods were placed flat, being separated by small pieces of refractory ware called spurs to prevent them from sticking together during firing, a process known as dottling. Other goods were placed edgeways on rods separated by thimbles, a process called rearing. Cups were loaded in the sagger by a method known as bat and dump. Firing was expensive, so sagger space was filled up with small items. Yeah. 
Place strips known as wadding were placed around the top of each saga. And these were made by extruding clay through a metal plate. Wadding made a seal between one saga and the next when they were stacked. The head placer or cod placer then directed the placing of sagas in the oven. The kiln consisted of two main parts. The outer part was known as the hovel and when freestanding was bottle shaped. The hovel acted as a chimney, taking away smoke and creating a draught as well as protecting the oven inside from the weather. The inner part was the oven. It was round with a domed roof. There were iron bands called bonts around the oven at regular intervals for added strength. Men could walk between the hovel wall and the oven to stoke or bait the fires at the fire mouth. The temperature in the oven could be partly controlled by the damper located in the crown and by the regulating holes. The progress of the firing could be seen through the spy holes. A trial would be drawn from the trial holes at different levels to measure the progress of firing. This method of taking a trial was laid on a sound experimental basis by Josiah Wedgwood in the late 18th century. There was a doorway known as a clamins or wicket, just large enough for a man to go through with a sagger on his head. Heat was distributed inside the oven by truncated and perforated flues called bags, one for each fire mouth, and by a flue going to the center of the oven. Sometimes ovens were grouped together inside a workshop. In these cases, the familiar bottle shape of the hovel was absent at ground level. The workshop protected the oven and the only part of the bottle shape to be seen was the bulge above the crown leading to the chimney which protruded through the workshop roof, as here at the Sutherland Works. The placers carried the saggers on their shoulders or heads. They put a rolled up stocking inside their hats to protect their heads and keep the sagger steady. When the saggers were placed, they had to be arranged so that the wares able to withstand higher temperatures were nearer the heat. Broken brick or sagger was used to keep the stacks of saggers or bungs level. A wooden ladder, the os, was used to place near the crown. Look 
Just one, two, three, four, 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 four five, nine. <laughs> nine seconds. Shall we get nine seconds ready? Just nine, and the finish is off. I know we've got to. Four. If we put four on. Glad, you? Put four on. We put four on without watch. Okay. Right. And then it'll be. Uh, that, your, your fourth end is falling back a bit, John. The back. A bung of bottomless saggers, called the pipe bung, was placed in the centre of the oven to act as a chimney. Then the other bungs were set in from the outside walls to the centre. We've got four, we've got four without ones, and then that'll... Give, give us one, two, three, four saggers, really. Yeah. Saggers containing trial rings were placed at different levels and carefully lined up with the trial holes from the outside. The final quarter was set from the centre out to the clamins. An average oven held about 2,000 saggers, and when it was full, the clamins were sealed up with bricks and sand. The trial holes were sealed at the same time. At this stage, the fireman took over. His job was one of the most important in the pot bank. firing used a lot of coal. The fires were baited as necessary, some fire mouths receiving more coal than others, depending on the temperature to be reached, the design of the oven and the direction of the wind. Conditions varied and the firemen's skills in reading them were vital to the success of a firing. To begin with, the temperature was kept low while the moisture in the ware was driven out. Then baiting increased until in about 48 hours, a maximum temperature of between 1,000 and 1,250 degrees centigrade was reached. The temperature was partly controlled by altering the position of the crown dampers and by the fire doors and regulating holes. Simon and his men would stay up with the firing, cooking their food and taking such rest as they could by the oven.
trial rings were taken from the different quarters of the oven towards the end of the firing. The firemen measured their contraction on a scale and this indicated the stage the firing had reached. At the end of the firing, the dampers were adjusted, the fire doors opened, and the fires allowed to go out. In the cooling, the clamens was pulled down, and the fire masks were raked out, ready for the next firing. When they were cool enough to handle, the saggers were drawn from the oven and put on specially built staging. Some 19th century pottery masters were known to try and speed up the process by drawing goods hot from the oven. The men were paid according to the amount of perfect ware drawn. In times of bad trade, the master potter often resorted to paying his men in truck, in goods rather than money. The times are bad, I can't command a ready money bill. And I've so large a stock on hand, my works must soon stand still. I really know not what to do, so wayward is me luck. Unless the teach and all of you, your wages take in truck. I've this, I've that, I've what you will, with prices on them stuck. The same as in the invoice bill for you to take in truck. I've grocery goods of every kind and every flavoured tea. Or green or black as you a mind, or congo or bohe. I've flour at so and so for stone, both coarse and fine to sell. And when for broth you want a bone, I still can suit so well. I've this, I've that, I've what you will, with prices on them struck. The same as in the invoice bill for you to take in truck. So let the times run how they will, I've taken special care. Though I'm without a money bill, you things to eat and wear. You scarcely men can fail to see the great regard I show. So take the truck and grateful thee, and home contented go. The wares were then packed in barrels made on the premises and sent to markets all over the world. This has all gone. Except we should not be completely downhearted. This kiln and the remaining 47 bottle ovens in Stoke-on-Trent are all listed and cannot be demolished. Organisations like the Gladstone Pottery Museum, Stoke-on-Trent Council and Middleport Pottery keep much of the story alive. Thanks for watching. All credit to the producers of the two underlying colour films from over 40 years ago. What do you think? Yes, it is sad, but can we support those preserving our heritage today? Do leave a comment below. Look out for more films on pottery heritage from Stoke-on-Trent on the Potteries Author Channel.